Welcome to the STARS program, seniors taking active roles in society. And now, here's your host, Anita Finley. Well, this is such a, you know, this is such an unusual time in a sense to have a surgeon who deals with, a thoracic surgeon who deals with cancer on our show. I love that because there are people who are suffering. You know, when you're told that you have cancer and then you have to have surgery, it's like, you know, you want to fall down on the ground and hide. And so to have a surgeon here who can tell you what it's like for him to tell someone what they have to do and what he's going to do. So welcome to our show. And wait, wait, I didn't, I didn't say your name. Dr. Dennis Tishko, uh, who is um, a thoracic surgeon with Broward Health. Thanks for coming in. Oh, thank you for having me, Nina. I really appreciate the opportunity. So isn't that a hard thing for a doctor? You seem so sweet and so nice. Is That must be a terrible thing to have to talk to someone about. It's a hard thing to learn about. But I think what really helps me is knowing the information, knowing the science, knowing a little bit of the future and what to predict and how to talk about things in a way that lets people anticipate. I think you can put up with pretty much anything if you know what you're putting up with. So knowing that ahead of time goes a long way to easing people. So what made you, when you decided you wanted to study medicine, what made you go to this specialty? You know, that's an interesting question, and I've asked myself that <laughs> many times. But I think one of the things that really attracted me was the difficulty. It's a long, tedious process. The training is very long. And I think I was fascinated with learning the technical aspects of that. So I think it really has to do with the training, the intensity, and that was something that I really, really liked. I still like it. And of course, now we have robotic surgery, but your hands are very important in this whole procedure. Oh, they very much are. I think one of the hard things, one of the surprising things medical students learn is how much of surgery is touch. An enormous amount, particularly with what I do when we're talking about lung cancers in the chest. I very often can't see things, but I can feel them. So the concept of touch and knowing how things should feel, where they should be, is really critical. It's very critical. That's really beautiful that you said that. I didn't know that. So you can't see, but you are so experienced at touching. Is that coming from working on the cadavers? No. You know, I think some of it may be innate. Some people are more um, mechanically inclined. Some people are more uh, visually inclined. But particularly working with the lung, where you're dealing with a soft organ where cancers may be inside, an awful lot of it is what things feel like. I will tell you, I do a lot of symposiums, medical symposiums, and one which I'll never forget is it was um, one of the uh, scientists from Scripps Research, and he came in and he was, uh, I don't remember, it was quite a few years ago, I don't remember his name now, but he came in to talk to this nice crowd, and uh, he said, okay, if anyone's squeamish, they can leave. He pulled out a brain. So he could show everyone what a brain looked like, and we have never seen a brain. And so you're talking, because I'm sure that you, do you not have to deal with a brain, even though I know you're not in that area, but you've had to deal with brains. Sure. Oh, sure. And so... Part of, part of what we do with lung cancer is looking for where it may have spread, and brain is one of the top areas. So it's, uh, it's very much on our minds. I'm glad you brought that up. I did know someone that had lung cancer, and it wound up in their brain. Why is that? Well, any place blood goes, cancer cells can go. So if a cancer cell starts in one place through the bloodstream, it can make its way anywhere else. And the brain gets a huge amount of blood flow. So the brain is very often one of the places where cancer cells can move, particularly lung cancer cells. All right. Well, let's move back now. So let's say you do surgery on a lung. Uh, does that mean that that person will live a long time or is that just something that's, is that chronic? Is that, um, what, what happens when someone has lung cancer and you finish your great work? That is a really important question and everything depends on the type of cancer, how far it's spread, its size, whether it's moved outside of its original place. That refers to the stage. If it is an early cancer, an early stage cancer, and we remove it, people have a 90 or 95% chance of having their normal lifespan. 
So caught early, lung cancer can be very well managed. The problem with lung cancer is we very often catch it later than we want and the results aren't as good. So how should someone even be able to detect that they have anything wrong with their lung? That's a very difficult problem because the lung, particularly lung cancers, don't very often give us symptoms. In the vast majority of cases, people have no symptoms. People can have huge lung tumors and not feel a thing. No kidding. So it's not like a breast cancer where you may feel a lump. It's not like a colon cancer where you may see some blood. Very often lung cancers are silent and that's what makes them really deadly. Oh my goodness. Well, that's, uh, that's new. So, uh, there, I mean, is there, I mean, are there scans that people can take once a year just to see if anything's going on in their body? There are, and that really has been very much the holy grail for those of us who deal with lung cancer. You know, if you have a colonoscopy, you can find out what's happening to your colon. If you have a mammogram, you can see what's happening with your breast. For decades, literally for decades, we were trying to find some test that would let us find lung cancer, especially in people who are at risk for lung cancer. Finally, a few years ago, a major study was done that lets us do lung cancer screening with a CAT scan. So we finally have a screening test for lung cancer. It's just been very slow to roll out, very slow to get people interested in. Well, now people might have cysts on their lungs, which are not you know, cancerous. There can be all kinds of things, cysts, small nodules, old scars. The number of findings on a CAT scan is pretty large, but if we're looking at people who are at risk, particularly smokers or ex-smokers, those are the people we really want to concentrate on. Those are the people we want to be screening. Okay, so I'm just I, you, you took the words out of my mouth. My question was, the risk is really for people who smoke. Are there other, are, but there's also genetics. Aren't there other... There are. It's a remarkably complicated topic, and that topic gets more complicated every month. But what we know right now is the highest risk group, the group that we should be paying the most attention to, are those who've smoked and had a significant smoking history. So those are the people we're really concentrating on and trying to bring back into the screening programs because the results are outstanding. Okay, so people who smoke, and there are seems some people can cut right off and never smoke again, and other people have to have the patches and have other things, and it just doesn't work. In fact, I don't know, the last, I did an interview where he was saying about smoking, the, the guest said that uh, if you, you know, if you're off and one, you have one cigarette, you might as well buy another pack because you're back again. It's that serious an addiction, isn't it? It's a difficult topic, but... I think you can't underestimate somebody's motivation. I always tell people before surgery they need to stop smoking. And they need to stop smoking for very good scientific reasons. The risk of a heart attack goes up, the risk of pneumonia goes up, the risk of all complications after surgery go up if you don't quit smoking. For the majority of patients, the vast majority of patients, they understand that. And looking at surgery, the entertainment value for the cigarettes goes way down. So most patients are able to quit without very much drama. And I think that motivation, knowing what they're really headed for, is an enormously powerful motivator. Okay, well, we've been talking about the lungs. Talk about other parts of the body that you get that scalpel in, or, or are you doing any robotic surgery now? We do some robotic. My preference for thoracic surgery is to use a scope, and I don't know if you've got much experience no, with that. No, please but talk. No, tell us about it. There are small scopes, um, not much bigger than the size of your little finger, that we can slip into a chest, and instruments designed for that. It's called video-assisted thoracic surgery. That's my preference. Some surgeons like the robot. There are plenty of times, though, where we need to do standard surgeries with regular incisions. For instance, if you have a very large tumor, it's not going to come out in a small incision. So I like to tailor the operation to what we really need to do. Well, 
so let's just go through. Um, what other what other experiences have you sh can you share that you just shared about the lung? You're so interesting. I think people, you know, it's why I love having someone like you on the show because most doctors have all these secrets <laughs> and they do these wonderful things and they work day and night and they they save lives and sometimes lives are lost. But to have you here on the radio for 30 minutes, you have a busy schedule to come in here. Thank you so much for doing this. Oh, I appreciate it. I think this is an enormously important topic. And I don't think it gets the publicity or the awareness that it really should. You know, lung cancer, I really think after having done this for a while, I think lung cancer has one of the lowest sex appeals of anything in medicine. Nobody wants to hear about it. Nobody wants to talk about it. There are no Hollywood movie stars there's no marathons there's no ribbons for it but the magnitude of the problem is really enormous much more than most people realize and by that i mean lung cancer kills more people than colon cancer and breast cancer and prostate cancer and ovarian cancer and uterine cancer and brain cancer put together well, this is big news. I'm going to ask you, and you, you can commit or you don't have to commit. I want you to write an article for Boomer Times. You've seen our magazine, I have to assume. I have. Okay. Why don't you write an article on lung cancer? Because I don't remember having one on lung cancer, as a matter of fact. And what you just said is, is unknown. I've never heard those statistics. You would be shocked at how many doctors don't know that. It's a... It's a problem, the magnitude of which is almost hard to imagine. For instance, lung cancer is killing four or five times as many people as breast cancer. Lung cancer kills 28 times more people than AIDS. And ask yourself, what do we hear about? We don't, but, but maybe it's because it's not easy to detect. And because you're saying it's killing them. What, how many people have you saved who've had lung cancer. That's maybe the ratio of that is would be important. So when someone comes to you, I mean, now we know breast cancer, they have a vasectomy, they have something and, it, and they get saved, but how about, how about people who you are saving? What's the percentage? That is a very good question and that lets me talk about the screening. Here's what we know. If we look at the people who are at risk, high risk individuals, people who've smoked. Those are the people that we're screening. When we talk about cancer, we talk about survival in terms of five-year cancer survivals. So five-year survival is the standard way we, we refer to things. For lung cancer patients who've been screened, the survival is 71%. For those who aren't screened, it's 19%. The results are wow. overwhelmingly positive. Oh my gosh. We are doubling the number of early stage cancers that we can see when we screen people, and that's where the survival comes from. So when we catch an early stage cancer, I'm able to give a person back their regular life. We don't give them back 5% or 10%. An early stage lung cancer is an opportunity to give somebody back the rest of their life. Whatever their warranty card has left on it, that's what they get. You're so good. The issue, though, is catching those people, screening those people, getting the message out, letting people know that if they have been a smoker, if they know somebody who's a smoker, they need to be thinking about that screening test. All right, what does the screening uh, in include? What happens? I think it may be the easiest screening test in the history of the world. The test that we use is a high-speed CAT scan. And when I say high-speed, it's a four-second scan. So if there's something faster out there, I don't know about it. It does not use any dye or contrast, so there's no needles. It will probably take you longer to get on the table and off the table than it will to be scanned. So in terms of ease, it can't get much easier than that. Virtually all insurances cover this. So in terms of payment, that's taken care of. At Broward, we're able to do a scan for those who are uninsured for $99. So it is a very low barrier. People who have the risk factors, people who've smoked, should really be thinking about this. Even if people haven't smoked, chances are they know somebody who did, somebody they're close to, somebody they care about. So if you know somebody who smoked or if you yourself smoked, 
this should be at the top of your mind and you should ask your doctor, talk to us over at North Broward. We're happy to get the scans arranged, but it's enormously important. Well, we're going to see an article from Dr. Tishko on this because I'm so impressed. This is Dr. Dennis Tishko, T-I-S-H-K-O, and he's the director of the Thoracic Oncology there at Broward Health Medical Center. And uh, so you've made it very easy, so I, I think people should do that. I can tell you I know probably five people right now I'm going to encourage, but I think that um, we definitely should, should be a, maybe a lung cancer screening month. I would love to see that. <laughs> and you know, this program is part of getting that word out, so I really do appreciate it very much. One of the things that's really surprising to people is the number of lives we're going to save. Screening for lung cancer is going to save more lives than colonoscopy and mammography put together. So if you think colonoscopy is important, if you think mammograms are important, add those up and that's where we start with the lung cancer screening. But getting the word out has been a very difficult challenge. We're only screening 2% of the people we should. We're missing 98% of the people who should be screened. Okay, Dr. Jishko, you and I are going to work on this together. I am going to help you. All with right, this. we got a, we got a project. I, I am going to work and help you with this because um, your uh, your statistics are unknown. I I've never heard these before. It's shocking. And and you're telling me that it's for anyone that worries about getting into machines, it's 2 seconds. It's not a problem. And they just go, they make an appointment, and uh, everybody, let me do this, I want to get away. You don't have to call Dr. Tishko direct, but you can call Broward Health Medical Center or any of the Broward Health um, North or Broward Health and Bureau Point anywhere. Sure. And you can ask to make an appointment to have a, uh, a screening of your lung. It's called a lung screening. What is it called? Lung cancer screening test. Lung cancer screening test. Or you could go through your primary care doctor's or you could call my office. If you know somebody who smoked, or if you yourself had had a significant smoking history, it's something to be thinking about. It's an easy test, it's a painless test, but the amount of information and the benefit is enormous. Have you ever smoked? I have not. I've not either. My family did not, and that's probably why I didn't. And I, But do you have anyone in your family who smoked? Not so far as I know. See? But you're, you're exactly right that it does tend to be in families. It tends to be a generational issue. Now, fortunately, smoking is at an all-time low. The whole question of this vaping issue is really sort of looming on the horizon, and it's a, it's a separate topic. We can talk about that sometime. But the problem is lung cancers can take decades to develop. So even if you stop smoking, if everybody stopped smoking right now, we would still see another 20 years of cancers coming down the line. And why is that? Why, why does the, once you, the nicotine, what is it like, residue, it just sits there? No, nicotine doesn't cause cancer. Nicotine's bad for your blood vessels, it's bad for your heart. But nicotine itself doesn't cause cancer. It's the tars, it's the burned chemicals in the cigarette smoke that cause cancer. Nicotine is not a cancer-causing agent. No, that's something I didn't know. And... It, it's one of those things that gets caught up in the mythology and sort of the, the dogma of these things. So nicotine by itself doesn't cause cancer, but all the burned chemicals, all the cyclic aromatic amines, those are the things that can cause cancer, the anthracyclines. So it's the burning process that we're concerned about. Is that why coal miners have a lot of this, the same thing, the tar from the... Coal miners in certain third world countries where small houses are heated with a fire inside the house, lung cancers skyrocket because they're around burned chemicals. So there's a lot of biology, there's a lot of mechanics with this that really sort of feed into it. But the bottom line is, lung cancer is such an enormous problem. It probably touches everybody, even people who've never smoked, families that have never smoked, you probably know somebody who has. Oh, absolutely. Um, and getting that word out and letting them know this test is out there is hugely important. Was there a, uh, was there a Nobel Prize given to the 
the scientists who discovered the screening for lung cancer? I don't think so. The test, <laughs> the test has just been out a few years now, but I wouldn't be surprised if something doesn't come out of that. It's really been an enormous challenge to gather the data to come up with a test that proves this. And what's interesting is when that study was published, the results were so positive that the test was stopped. It wasn't felt ethical to keep going. The results were so good, they stopped the test and said, we can't ethically stop this, this test from being done for people. So there was a 20% reduction in death, which is huge for a screening test. One of the things that's never been seen before was when we screen for lung cancer, there's a 7% drop in deaths from all other causes. So simply looking for this problem gives us a heads up about lots of other things as well. And that's a, that's a remarkable accomplishment for a test. Absolutely. And when, when you think about the, the amount of people then who are saved from this simple test, it, and people aren't doing it, I have no idea about it. It's 98% it's, of the people who should be tested are not being tested. 98%. I, that's terrible. And the fact that you mentioned that if someone doesn't have insurance, it's only less than $100 to have this test done. Now, how, I know you're a busy doctor. How many operations do you do a week on average? <laughs> Okay, start counting. Probably, probably how, how eight many? or ten. Eight or ten. And so you, uh, do you get a lot of sleep at night? <laughs> sure. I've, I've gotten used to it. Yeah. Uh, okay. And it's, it's the sort of thing that you really have to like. You have to enjoy it. It has to be fun in an in a interesting way. It's a, it's a fun thing to go in, knowing how to do these operations and getting them done well and getting people up and running. It's a, it's a, it's a very rewarding job. Yeah, I feel that with you. And so um, your family must be so proud of you. <clears throat> so um, are your parents still living? They are not. Okay. But, you know, you're still a young man. And my mother lived to be 94. So I asked that question to everybody. Very yeah, remarkable. Right. That's right. But anyway, um, just getting back to what you do at Broward Health, I want everyone to know that, yes, I love Broward Health. I, I'm really on their foundation board. And, Broward Health, the doctors with Broward Health are phenomenal. I've spent so much time with so many of them, but I never met Dr. Tishko until today, but we're going to become fast friends because I'm going to help him. <laughs> I'm going to help him with um, uh, trying to get screenings done for uh, lung cancer. And we'll, I think if you start with an article, and then we can maybe have, maybe just like a little, I usually do fillers. What about a little filler? Have you had your, you know, if you're a smoker or know someone, have you had your screening done? Something like that. And we'll, we'll start something. I think that's really good. And having the conversation, having it on people's mind, having the awareness of this is, is enormously important. And I don't think there's anybody out there, I don't think anybody's listening who doesn't know somebody affected by lung cancer. Somewhere, somebody loves somebody, somebody cares about somebody. And lung cancer has been a topic. We need to talk about that more. We need to approach it better. We need to be very deliberate and very black and white about how we look at this because for the first time, we really have a chance to get ahead of this. And we need to do that. Do you think that people don't do this because they're afraid of what they may find? That is a conversation I have regularly. And one of the things that I hear is, well, if I have cancer, I don't want to know about it. And I tell people that is a profoundly bad idea. That's an astonishingly bad idea. Especially since you told us that you can help people if it hasn't gone very far. Exactly. And I think one of the things that we're dealing with is this sort of backlog, this sort of old-fashioned way of thinking. Well, if I have cancer, I don't want to know about it. But we don't think that way about breast cancer. We don't think that way about colon cancer. So why would lung cancer give us a different slant on it? And we need to change that conversation. Maybe because they're afraid they have to give up the smoking. <laughs> you it know, as compared to with colonoscopy and or of breast cancer, it's not something that they have to give something up other than diet and exercise or something like that. And you know, that's a, that's a really interesting question and one that I wrestle with all the time. 
I will sit down with a patient and say, I think we've got lung cancer here. You have lung cancer. And they'll be fairly sanguine about it. They'll, we'll be talking about it. And I'll say, you have to quit smoking. And the people will cry. Okay. I've seen this repeatedly. People who aren't really disturbed by a diagnosis of cancer will cry when they find out they have to quit smoking. I think Not somebody, so much they have lung cancer, but they're going to cry right. because they have smoke. So yeah, I think to, somebody could get a PhD yeah, thesis yeah, on yeah, that. Yeah, we're going to work on this together. You and I are going to work on this. So save some time for me because we're going to do this. All and, right, pencil me in. Yeah, I'm going to pencil you in. And I am so glad that you came on my show. You came here early on a Saturday morning. You are special. And we are going to do what we can. And uh, the, you've been listening to Dr. Dennis Tishko, T-I-S-H-K-O. He is director of the Thoracic Oncology there at Broward Health. I am just so thrilled, and thank you very much, and keep making people feel good. Thank you. Nick. And I want everyone to please remember to come to the Boomer Expo January the 22nd. It's this coming Tuesday, and we are going to um, have a fantastic time. We have the, the Boomer Boys. We have the Ziegfeld Folly Ladies. We have, we actually have, I'll just tell you very quickly, because I know I don't have much time, but for those of you who saw the Life magazine with the man the sailor who came off and kissed the nurse and the cover we have that gentleman and he's coming he's 93 and he's going to be there at our expo signing photographs and we talk about and so i'm sure he doesn't have he doesn't have one here uh thank you very much we'll be back next week